Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Long. This is the last lecture in our series of our coronavirus or COVID shutdown videos. Um, so this video is being um, made for my students taking my class at Del Mar College. Uh, Human Anatomy and Physiology 2 is the target group for this video. This video is going to be over development, um, going from fertilization all the way through development in the womb. Um, we may talk a little bit about after birth, but that's really a class that's called uh, Human Growth and Development or Developmental Psychology or something. I forget what they call that course now. It used to be called Human Growth and Development. But nonetheless, um, there's a part of that that goes on in other courses. So I'm going to do what we need to do for my class, and I'll leave the rest to someone else. If you're following along in my class, we're in the notes set. We're going to be on page 104. Some of the stuff I'm going to draw is um, actually going to, it's going to start on the bottom of page 103. As you guys know, we've talked about gametogenesis in the last video, the development of the, of the oocyte or the sperm. Now, um, I'm going to start with some of the female anatomy that I didn't go over in the previous video because I knew we were going to have to do it here. You should be familiar with this anatomy. When we start to look at the, uh, the vagina as a muscular tube, that extends between the uterus and the outside body where the labia are, the external genitalia. Um, it serves as a passageway for the penis to, during intromission. It can receive the ejaculate when a male ejaculates for fertilization. Now sitting on top of that is a large sort of pear-shaped organ. I'm going to leave a couple of gaps here for a reason. That sits down right inside of all of this. And this large organ is going to be called the uterus. And I'm kind of exaggerating it a little bit, but not really. Um, and a part of the, the uterus that extends down into the vagina, this part right here that I'm going to color in in purple, is referred to as the cervix. Cervix means neck. The uterus has a body. It has an isthmus. This term isthmus means a narrowing. And then it becomes the cervix or the neck. Okay. Now, um, attached to the uterus are the two fallopian or uterine tubes. Uh, a lot of modern textbooks are taking out the names of the people that did a lot of this original science and has their name attached. I guess there's a fallopian somewhere, Dr. Fallopian or Fallopia or something. But back over here would be the ovary. The ovary is attached to the uterus by an ovarian ligament so that it can't float away. This would be the uterine or fallopian tube. And then these little things are each called a fimbria. Fimbria, fimbria would be singular. If we put an E at the end, it would be fimbria, E, it would be plural. And we have another paired uh, fallopian tube over here, or uterine tube, and we'll have another ovary over here attached. Okay, I didn't, may not have drawn it uniformly, but there's a, I need a larger one for a reason. Now, as you guys know, the lining of the uterus can fill up with blood. The endometrium becomes very engorged with blood, during part of the menstrual cycle, which we did in a previous video. Okay, So all of this blood is very rich in oxygen and nutrients because if the egg is fertilized, it needs amino acids and glucose and oxygen and nu nucleic acids and lipids to grow and develop and grow and develop and grow and develop. Because it can't consume it, it has to absorb it from the blood lining. So mom deposits very nutrient and oxygen rich blood and ion rich blood as the endometrium. Now, when the ovary uh, ovulates and releases the oocyte, the oocyte itself, I think I made it a little light blue cell earlier, has a crown of cells that surround it called the corona radiata. And so there's a little ring of cells outside the oocyte called the corona. The word corona means crown. So it's called the corona radiata. Because when you look at it, it's like sunshine, you know, around the sun radiating out. Corona means crown. That's where the coronavirus gets its name from. It looks like a little crown of proteins on the outside of it. So it's crown shaped. Anyway. Um, so the corona radiata are the cells that surround the oocyte, and when the um, uh, when when LH causes ovulation, then the oocyte will be released, and the fimbriae, by the way, are slightly beating and trying to pull fluid in, so that the oocyte ends up inside the fallopian tube here. 
Now, the corona radiata is still surrounding it. If the egg is going to be fertilized, usually the egg must be fertilized in about the first one-third of the fallopian tube. Okay? The sperm has to reach it here. And one of those reasons is, once the sperm penetrates, the oocyte will shed the corona radiata. And when we look at the cell, it looks like it has a single membrane around it, but it actually separates into two membranes. One is going to be called the fertilization membrane because if the sperm penetrates, that fertilization has occurred. But that will separate out and create a little space. So when you look at the models, uh, I believe it's model number two, you'll see a ring of membrane around called the fertilization membrane, and the spermatozoan is penetrating that. And there's a second membrane in here called the zona pellucida. And it is a thin membrane. And then we would have the cytoplasm and the nucleus of the oocyte in here with all its chromosomes. So that second membrane is called the zona pellucida. Pell means almost and lucid means clear. It's sort of a milky white color, like you can almost see through it. It's almost clear. Zona pellucida. The space between them is called the perivitelline space. If you look at that space, peri means around, vita means life. So perivitelline means the little space or the space around the little living thing. So once the sperm penetrates the, um, the uh, fertilization membrane, the corona radiata gets shed and lost, and then what will separate out is the zona pellucida separates out as a separate membrane. It's almost a thick, leathery thing. Once, this, the, once the sperm penetrates, there's a chemical reaction that makes it a little tougher and harder, almost like a shark egg or a turtle egg, that leathery-looking thing. So now... Once the sperm penetrates, it will simply inject its nucleus with its chromosomes, and almost all the rest of the sperm stays outside and is broken down. So somewhere along the way, this cell is going to have two separate nuclei, or what are called pronuclei. They're called pro because it's before a nucleus. So what we end up with is a female pronucleus and the male pronucleus. <laughs> They're called a pronucleus because it's not technically a total nucleus until all the chromosome has been mixed. The female pronucleus has mom's 23 chromosomes from meiosis, oogenesis, and the male pronucleus has the male chromosomes, 23 of them through spermatogenesis. Now, once those two pieces of DNA or two sets of chromosomes fuse those nuclei together, we will actually have a complete cell, a one-celled human being called a zygote. But, as I said before, the cell, female cell is actually frozen in meiosis 1, in prophase 1 of meiosis 1. I know in my notes that it says prophase 1 and then it says meiosis 2. That's a typo. But the female egg will, will go through the meiotic divisions of oogenesis but stop in prophase 1. So, once the sperm penetrates, something triggers this to divide. And one of the things that happens is as it separates its chromosomes, that extra set that's not needed get kicked out into a little structure that just contains a bunch of DNA, and we call that the um, polar body. They didn't know what they were initially. They just saw it was on one pole of the cell. The female pronucleus will finish its second round of division, and kick out a second polar body. So sometimes they're called the first polar body and the second polar body. And then eventually we will fuse the two, the, the, that last set of chromosomes, the good set from mom and the good set from dad, fuse together. And once we get a one-celled person that has 46, that funny-looking X is going to be my abbreviation for chromosomes. That is called a zygote. That is essentially a one-celled person. Okay, That zygote is going to form somewhere in the first one-third. Now, it takes about 24 hours for the first cell division, but then all the others start happening very, very rapidly. That cell is going to divide by mitosis into two cells. That's going to divide into four cells. That's going to divide into eight cells, and then 16, and eventually we get this little ball of identical cells that's about to enter into here. And so there's all these cells in here, and a massive ball, and that is called the, um, it's called a blastula. Now, 
or actually it's a morula, it's a solid mass of cells. Some of the cells, I'm going to just use two different colors here, or three different colors. I, I don't want to use red. Some of the cells, I'm going to color some in, start to differentiate from the others. And then the other cells will start to differentiate into two other groups. I'll leave some clear. But I have some brown cells, some blue cells, and some clear cells here. At one stage of development, all of these cells are identical to the zygote. And what's happening is, if I have a gene on chromosome 1 that's being expressed in one cell, when this cell divides into two cells, it turns out that that exact same gene on chromosome 1 will be active in both cells. If this cell has gene 2 on chromosome 1 turned off, then this cell has gene number 2 on chromosome 1 turned off. Each cell is expressing the exact same genes, making the exact same proteins, and performing identical functions. At some point in time, if one of the cells decides, I'm going to turn off chromosome number one and turn on chromosome number two, and this cell does not do that, those two cells would be expressing different proteins, and therefore would be behaving, functioning differently, since proteins perform all the functions. We call that process of cells turning on and off different genes and functioning differently, that process is called differentiation. That's where the cells start to become different from each other. And in differentiation, these groups of cells in here start, start separating out. One group of cells is going to form a structure called the chorion. The chorion is actually going to attach to the blood lining here and start to grow into it with some, it'll develop some villi, chorionic villi, and attach to the uterus. And that's going to increase the surface area for the absorption of nutrients. And then this little ball of cells will actually start to hollow out and form two specific layers of cells. On our models, I think they're pink and yellow. And so we'll get a little empty space in here, and we'll get a little layer of pink cells, and we'll get a little layer of yellow cells. They're called the epiblast and the hypoblast. The space inside of here becomes the amniotic cavity. This space out here is called the blastocele or the extra embryonic coelum. This word, it looks like coel or coel, but seal means space or hollow area. So they call this the extra embryonic coelum, which means the empty space outside the embryo. So now we have a chorion, which is attached to mom, and eventually will morph into what we call the placenta. And then we have a thing called the blastodisc. The cellular trophoblast, the cells that make up this little blastodisc, are going to be the embryo. They are the embryo, and they're going to develop into a person. The chorion and all of this other stuff is going to develop into what we call the extra embryonic membranes, the things that are lost in the afterbirth that aren't part of the baby. Now, these cells continue to grow and divide and grow and divide, and one group of cells up here will actually start to try to grow in the middle and grow right down the middle. And that leads to development of what we call the germ layers or germination. Not really germination, the formation of the germ layers. The germ layers are the layers of cells that form the major parts of your body. There's an area called the endoderm, Derm referring to like skin or layer. The endoderm is going to be the innermost part of your body. There's an area called the mesoderm. The mesoderm would be the middle layer. And then there's an area called the ectoderm. Okay. So just so that you guys are following along with me, we've covered everything on the bottom of page 103. I talked a little, well, I didn't talk about amphimixis, but that's the fusing of the DNA. Um, we're, going, we're going over the first trimester. The blastocyst formation, the cell divisions are called first cleavage, second cleavage, and then beyond that, everything changes. This hollow ball of cells is going to become a blastula or blastocele, and then we're going to get development of the germ layers called gastrulation. I said germination. That's not it. That's when seeds are germinating. Gastrulation is the formation of the germ layers, and during gastrulation, the formation of the germ layers, we get three layers that form. Um, 
the ectoderm is the outside of your body. Ecto means outside. So that's the outside, your skin, the hair, the nails. But oddly enough, the nervous system develops from the ectoderm. Your skin starts to develop, but then a little piece of it will invaginate and form an area where the brain will form. And then eventually that becomes a hollow tube where the spinal cord will deform. So that's an invagination or a folding in of the ectoderm. So your skin and your nervous system are derived from the same tissue. Mesoderm means middle. And it's not quite deep inside, but everything in between. The mesoderm will develop a lot of your connective tissues. It will develop muscle and bone and connective tissues like ligaments and tendons, cartilage. Um, some of your cardiovascular tissue develops from that. And then the endoderm is going to develop into the most inner part of your body, the insides, the digestive tract, and part of your respiratory tract develop from the endoderm. And you can remember, endo is inside, digestive and respiratory. Meso is in the middle, muscle, connective tissue. And ecto is outside, the skin and the nervous system. Okay, So you need to know that. Um, let's see. If we go to page 105, if we're following along... Then we start to form some of the extra embryonic membranes. You need to know these four membranes. The yolk sac literally is like a yolk that, a, that an egg would have when you crack a chicken egg or a bird egg. We develop the same way. We have a yolk that we can develop some nutrients from. That yolk sac will develop from some of the cells in here. We have the amnion. The amnion is the water bag. It's a fluid-filled bag that the baby is suspended in, the embryo and the fetus. Um, so that it is kind of protected for, as a shock absorber in there. And um, the allantois is going to develop parts of the um, umbilical cord. They develop from the allantois. And then the chorion is going to form the fetal portion of the placenta. The placenta is sort of a fusion of the endometrium and that chorion. By the way, the chorion is what secretes human chorionic gonadotropin. And that human chorionic gonadotropin will actually target the um, uh, corpus luteum and prevent it from de deteriorating into the corpus albicans. And so during pregnancy, the chorion is telling the corpus luteum, keep secreting progesterone so we don't menstruate. So human chorionic gonadotropin prevents the corpus luteum from breaking down so that you secrete progesterone throughout the pregnancy and don't menstruate. Um, and then... We talked about a little bit about relaxin, relaxing the pelvis, and uh, human placental lactogen feeds back to the brain and the breast tissue to develop for lactation. When you do pregnancy tests, they're actually testing for human chorionic atotropin and human placental lactogen. And those two hormones, if they're present, you're pregnant because they only develop if you have a chorion and implantation occurred and if you're getting ready to lactate. Placentation is uh, when we form the, the placenta, the chorionic villi grow into the endometrium and they fuse together. Um, then some blood vessels will, will join in here and grow into that. And as the uh, blastodisc that has the endo, meso, and ectoderm, as those cells continue to divide and differentiate and start forming what we consider to look like a little, uh, the first like a little tadpole and then a little massive tissue about the size of your thumb where we're starting to develop all these organs um, blood vessels are growing through the from the baby once it develops the um, from the embryo once it develops a heart it will develop uh, the arteries for the major arteries the aorta and the, the vena cava and part of those will branch off and grow through the chorion through the umbilical cord eventually, what forms the allantois and the umbilical cord, and will connect to mom's blood vessels. Some maternal blood vessels develop in here and start to leak a little bit of blood to replenish the area of the endometrium that is being um, sort of uh, drained of its nutrients while the baby's developing. Once mom and the baby's blood vessels connect through the umbilical cord, which attaches at your umbilicus, now mom can feed all of her blood supply into the developing embryo and fetus. Uh, so embryogenesis, uh, that's the physical and developmental uh, formation of the blastodisc into an embryo during the second and third trimester. There's a couple of highlights I want you to know in a few of the trimesters. They're on page 106. Um, some things you should know about maternal systems during pregnancy. Um, do I even have the trimesters in here? I thought I did somewhere. Sorry, folks. 
Uh, I had something that happens. There's a spot where I really point out what happens in the major, in the three tri. Oh yeah, back on page 104. I'm sorry for jumping around. During the first trimester, you have the the rudimentary the roots or rudiments of all the major organ systems begin to appear. During the second trimester, the organs complete their uh, formation. And during the third trimester, they start to become functional. All your organ systems are starting to function. You have a rapid fetal growth, um, some fat deposition in the third trimester. But that's where the fetus is. In the second trimester, we form the organ systems, and they complete their formation. In the third trimester, they become functional and will start growing like crazy. You need to know that information. Finally... Uh, Read the section on page 105 about the second and third trimester. Page 106, you need to know the maternal systems. A bunch of things happen. Because the mom is now eating and breathing and feeding two bodies with, uh, with energy and nutrients, uh, maternal blood volume will increase some. Um, the mother begins to breathe deeper and heavier, so we increase respiration. There's uh, increased nutritional requirements. Females will eat a lot more when they're pregnant because they need to. We have to filter more waste because now she's not only filtering the waste developed by her body, but also by the baby's body that's growing in her, the embryo and the fetus. And uh, the uterus will obviously increase in size. Labor and delivery, there's three stages of labor. They were supposed to come out in bold. Dilation is when the cervix begins to dilate or open up. Um, the expulsion stage is when the um, baby begins to exit through the, um, through the cervix and the vagina. And then afterward is the placental stage where the placenta or the afterbirth should come out. It doesn't always come out and sometimes there's procedures that need to be done. Um, multiple births, monozygotic twins, or when you have um, a single zygote that uh, is fertilized and then... Um, at the first cleavage, it separates into two individual cells, and then they eventually each turn into an embryo. So those are identical twins or maternal twins. In fraternal twin, twins, called dizygotic twins, you actually ovulate two separate eggs that are fertilized by two separate sperms. So identical twins are one egg and one sperm fuse. After the first cleavage, the cells separate and develop into two totally different individuals that are identical genetically. In fraternal twins, it's two totally different eggs. One can be male, one can be female, whatever, but they don't look identical. They're actually two independent individuals that are not genetically identical. Uh, during postnatal development, you know, this has kind of changed recently. What used to be called the neonatal period was from birth to the first month. Some books are now saying it's the first two months. You know, I'm still going to go with what's in my notes. The birth from birth to the first month is called the neonatal period. Um, and then from then on, you go into, you know, baby or an infant, a toddler, and go through all your stages of development. We don't have time to go through all life's developments. We've been talking about that all semester, what's happening with the body and how it functions. So, listen, I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you enjoyed your semester. I know it was um, tainted by this coronavirus shutdown, and we didn't get to interact the way that I like to. But nonetheless, um, I hope you gathered the information that you need to set the foundation so that you can be successful at the next level. Um, anyway, again, I hope you had as much fun as I did watching all these videos or as much fun as I did making them. And I hope to see you guys on the flip side somewhere out there. If you see me in the streets, say hey. All right. Thanks for watching.